Hello. Uh, so in this presentation, I wanted to talk some more about the uh, ignorant schoolmaster, look at the translator's introduction, try to set up some of the context a little more, and try to explain, even though that's kind of uh, hypocritical or uh, contradictory at least, uh, why I thought this would be a good way to start our exploration into the issues of this course. Let's go to the, here we go. <laughs> Take me a while to get this uh, software set up, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, so he talks, uh, the book is largely inspired by this figure here, uh, Jacato, or Jacatou, I'm sorry, who was a, a figure in the uh, French Revolution and the, uh, he had to leave France after the Bourbon Restoration. Uh, we don't really need to get into a lot of the history here other than to uh, keep in mind this sort of revolutionary uh, context to Jacatou, uh, Jacatou's career as an educator. Uh, there were a lot of ex heavy experimentation, a lot of focus on the equality of, of people, um, even more radical than uh, I think in the American uh, Revolution, uh, this idea that all people are equal, uh, that there's a sort of a complete uh, intellectual emancipation. And a lot of this uh, factored into the way uh, that the uh, education was thought of, I guess, during this, this period. And uh, Jacques Attu was one of the key figures there. And here's his method in a nutshell, and you can read more about this on Wikipedia, actually. Uh, so all men have equal intelligence. I think today we'd say all people have equal intelligence, which uh, even today, that's kind of a radical idea, right? We, uh, You might think of yourself as very liberal, but you probably still think that some people are just smarter than others, or some people have uh, uh, disabilities or handicaps or that sort of thing that prevents them from ever achieving a certain level. Uh, so that would be counter to what Jacques Attu believed. I think everybody's just as smart as everybody else. Uh, so every person has received uh, from God the faculty of being able to instruct himself. And so that's kind of the ultimate autodidactic auto philosophy. You think about Benjamin Franklin, if you read his autobiography, he talks a lot about how you, know, you can learn all this stuff without a teacher just from reading books. Uh, you don't really need the teacher there. Uh, so no matter what it is you want to do with your life, you can learn how to do it on your own. You have that capability, at least. Um, and the third point is kind of where it starts to get interesting. Most people probably uh, could sympathize with those first two views, but this, this third one really seems preposterous. You can teach what you don't know. Uh, so imagine this, uh, and you've probably heard, I, I know I've heard a lot of uh, instructors say something like this. Uh, you know, I was given, I was assigned to teach this course even though I knew very little of the subject matter. Maybe I'm uh, teaching this a course in, say, uh, poetry, for example. I don't, I've don't. i never taken that many poetry classes. I don't really know anything about how to teach it, but suddenly you find yourself teaching uh, this course. And uh, Jacques Attu would say, there's nothing wrong with that. It might actually be advantageous uh, for your students if you don't know everything, or at least uh, <laughs> don't assume that you know everything about this topic and that you... Even if you don't know anything about it, you might actually be able to teach it. So uh, that's pretty interesting. And that last idea there, I think it has to do with the uh, idea that uh, it's all basically the same process of learning, uh, no matter what the uh, area is. Uh, okay, so that's the uh, Jacques Attu. Uh, and then we get into sort of the more, the more recent French uh, history. And I posted a link in the on the... Uh, uh, Canvas site on the first nugget where you can listen to this Yale University professor, uh, French professor, or French uh, history professor talk about this. It's very interesting. I strongly, if you have any interest in uh, history, I suggest you listen to that because I think it's kind of got an uncanny uh, resonance for us today, especially with this, you know, for the overthrow movement or was it a Occupy Wall Street movements and so on. That seems to kind of have some relevance there. But anyway, in 1968 in France, Again, I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not an expert here on this topic, but maybe that's an advantage, at least according to uh, Ron Sierre. Uh, but what I do know is this. There was a big crisis in education. Uh, there's, there's a couple factors for that. There's a lot of immigration happening. Uh, there's a big infl influx of non-traditional students into these schools. And these schools, uh, these French universities were never meant to accommodate this many students. Uh, you know, we think we have troubles in American education. Nothing like this. I mean, might have a the whole university maybe would have a thousand students. Suddenly they've got you know three or four times that number into the same space. Uh, very little money. It's just it's kind of a really bad time. 
We sort of had something like that happen here with the uh, GI Bill following the uh, World War II and the Vietnam uh, conflict, uh, but nothing like this. Just it was a really horrible time, and the there were various measures the professors had to try to deal with the situation. That was what they called a, a rhetoric of selection. So this idea that you know you're just not really cut out to be a college student. Uh, this isn't for you. Uh, so there was a lot of that sort of elitism going on. Uh, also, the uh, problem of what to do with these people if they do make it through the program, if they get their degree, there's no job waiting for them. Uh, so all this culminated in a lot of uh, strikes and protests, including this big one in uh, May of 1968. A lot of huge, huge general strike. Uh, a lot of people thought that, you know, it was finally happening. The Marxist revolution is going to happen. It's going to be this big uh, social turn, I guess, social revolution, but really just kind of petered out failed and then the, and politically what happened after this where the the conservative movement was even stronger than it was before uh, so this disillusioned a lot of people uh, that had kind of been banking on this being a big turning point right uh, so Pierre Bourdieu is another figure that factors in here and I'm a big fan of his work I've read this uh, language it's language and symbolic power He's kind of coming at this from a linguistic perspective, and I'll talk to you, a few of you about this, have linguistic backgrounds. Uh, so you, you might know there's a, I think there's still some movements in linguistics away from sort of the science of, uh, you know, sounds and phonemes or whatever, and more of a turn toward the social aspects of linguistics, sociolinguistics. Uh, so Purdue uh, heavily figures into that side of it. Uh, so he looks a lot at how the language itself can inculcate uh, class differences, and this is kind of commonsensical on, on a level, right? You can sort of tell if somebody's poor or rich or well-educated based on the way they, they speak. And so Purdue's really interested in this, and he's got a lot to say about it. I don't have time <laughs> to go into it all here. And you can obviously read the book if you're so inclined. Uh, but one of the things that does matter is, you know, this idea that schools are perpetuating inequality. I wanted to read you this a little passage here from uh, the language uh, language and symbolic power, uh, so you can get a feel for what uh, Purdue is, how he's coming at this. Uh, so let's see, I want to start here. So he's got correct usage, in quotation marks, is the product of a competence which is in, in, in which is an incorporated grammar. The word grammar being used explicitly and not tacitly as it is by the linguists in its true sense of a system of scholarly rules derived ex post facto from expressed discourse and set up as imperative norms for discourse yet to be expressed. It follows that one cannot fully account for the properties and social effects of the legitimate language unless one takes an, unless one takes account not only of the social conditions of the production of literary language and its grammar, but also of the social conditions in which this scholarly code is imposed and inculcated as the principle of the production and evaluation of speech. And so that's, you know, if you've... Uh, if you've taught grammar in your classes, which I'm sure a lot of you have, and you might never really thought about this, how you're kind of perpetuating the idea that there's a correct way of speaking and writing, and uh, that's not really correct in a logical sense so much as there's a political uh, dimension to it, right? The uh, you know the language of the dominant class, I guess. And so this is all fine, but uh, Rancière, uh, he's got a problem with this line of reasoning, and that it's it's kind of assuming, right, that well. If you have this, uh, if you're as enlightened as Purdue about all this, uh, then you need to share this information with people who, who haven't glommed onto it. You sort of got this he's sort of setting up the sociologist as the only person who's who's able to look at this situation and understand what's going on, right? And so again, you had this idea of all these naive people out, th all these ignorant people out there, and the only way they could ever be never realize how they're being subjugated is if somebody like a Purdue comes along and teaches them better, right? So it sort of schools them. And so the Rancière doesn't like that idea. And so what he wants to do is return to this uh, Jacques Attu's idea uh, that everyone is equally intelligent and uh, you can learn anything without a knowledgeable teacher. Uh, so again, we don't need Bordeaux to understand these things. You can learn it on your own. Uh, furthermore, the idea that you need a teacher, uh, that idea in and of itself is uh, what leads to inequality. You know, it's sort of this idea that you, know, you can imagine a kid, uh, uh, Rancière talks about the kids can learn how to speak a language. And there's actually some studies on this, right? That even if you sit down with a kid every day and tr try to teach the kid how to speak uh, English, let's say, 
uh, as uh, he or she's growing up, it's kind of debatable how much effect that really has. Uh, the kid's going to learn this language just by uh, seeing you and hearing you. And we'll talk more about this, but it sort of gets at this. That sort of gets at the idea of what what role does a teacher really is a teacher's role necessary uh, or not? And so he talks about how Jacques II students learned French just by looking at two different books. They had this French book, you know, a book written in French. They had another. They had another book that was a translation of that that was written, translation of it, written in Flemish. Uh, so Jacques II himself didn't know any Flemish. He couldn't even talk to these students, uh, but he just uh, gave them these two books and had them figure out uh, how to learn French uh, from this uh, just by looking at those two books. And he's, you know, you can sort of imagine how this could work, right? You got the translation there. You might look for similar words on the other side and gradually uh, learn French this way just by comparing the two. And the important thing, though, uh, I think the note here is that the students really wanted to do this. Uh, they had a strong desire to do this, and they worked together on it. And they didn't need the, the, the teacher's role. Jacques II wasn't useless here. You know, he's the one that came up with this idea for them to look, learn French this way, right? So it's not like he's serving no purpose. Uh, but the idea that he needs to learn Flemish and be the one to teach people that otherwise couldn't learn French any other way, uh, that's what he's criticizing. <laughs> and he also really goes on about how he doesn't like explications. Uh, so you probably have seen this many times. You have students read an essay or a poem, uh, let's say a novel, and then you take it upon yourself as a teacher to sort of break this down into pieces to explicate or to explain, you know, what does this text mean? Uh, how do you read a text like this? Sort of the assumption being, well, look, I already know what this text means. Uh, my point is to try to help you understand it the same way. Uh, so Ron Sierra asks, you know, why should the book need this help? Uh, that makes uh, probably more sense if you think about a textbook. So if you have, if you assign students a textbook, then why do you need to explain the textbook? You know, that's sort of weird, right? I mean, the textbook should, should need that kind of help. Uh, and he also points out, though, that you're kind of setting yourself up as the only person that can judge when the student actually understands it. And you also get into, you know, how simple can you does the explication never end? Uh, you could just you know, just go on forever explaining the explanation and then explaining that and so on. And so it kind of becomes what he calls a circle. And I thought of a, an example of this. I recently watched a, a documentary on Netflix. You, you can watch this too. It's uh, about, I think it's called Propaganda. I think it's the name of it. It talks about North Korea. It's a journalist got access to uh, North Korea and he's over there. Uh, studying everything. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but one of the things I thought was uh, interesting for us is this, uh, they talk a lot in the movie or documentary about Juche. Uh, so this is this philosophy of uh, North Korea. And what's interesting about it, at several points in the documentary, uh, the host or the presenter asks, you know, what is this philosophy? Can, can you explain this philosophy? Can, can anybody explain what Juche means? And uh, everybody says something along the lines of, Yes, of course, you know, I, I understand this, uh, but I can't really explain it to you in words. You just have to be familiar with North Korea. <laughs> and if, if you, it's almost sort of magical how you, you understand this. It can't really be explained. Everybody seems to understand it. And I think that kind of gets at that with this. Uh, what's so uh, interesting about it is you, you don't get promoted in this, in the system in North Korea unless you, unless people think that you really understand uh, Juche. But again, it can't really be explained. The only way you can really understand it is if somebody in power, I guess, decides that, yeah, okay, you seem to get uh, Juche, so you'll, you'll get the promotion. Uh, this other person doesn't really get it, uh, so he's going to be, or he or she's not going to get the same income level, the same benefits that you do. Uh, so that's kind of a, a brazen example, but I think it sort of gets at what, they're, what Ron Sierra is uh, concerned about. Uh, so again, he's, you know, so how do we teach? Uh, he says, well, people learn best just like they did when they were children, uh, just by hearing and retaining things, imitating, repeating, making mistakes, correcting yourself. Uh, sometimes you just get lucky and succeed. Then after you get lucky a few times, then you can become more methodical about it. And I, I thought there's a lot of uh, interest right now in higher education, composition, rhetoric, uh, digital humanities, and all this stuff about uh, the role of games. And can students learn by playing a game set up this 
sort of an educational game. And I think this is kind of almost sounds to me like one Rancière would agree with that idea. Because if you think about a game, it wouldn't be a very good game, right, if they had to explain everything to you, how to win the game. Uh, part of the fun is learning how to win on your own. And you don't want some, I mean, it's really horrible, right, if you're trying to play a game and you got somebody standing next to you that's already an expert trying to teach you how to play it, that's a lot less fun than if you just get in there and start messing around. And yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be terrible for a while, but eventually you're gonna figure out, okay, uh, that's that's how to play this game. And then you get better at it by maybe looking at the other players, doing what they do, it's sort of the same process. Uh, James Paul G has a book called uh, How Video Games Can Teach Language uh, and Literacy. I believe that's the uh, title, something along those lines. And G says basically the same thing, right? Uh, that so you can get more, you can learn, or people can learn more if they approach something as a game, something they want to learn how to do, or they have the desire to play, and it's not sort of crammed, or it's not uh, heavily contrived for them, but they sort of have room to get in there and succeed or fail uh, as they will. Uh, so again, teachers aren't useless. That's not what Ron Sears is saying. We don't need teachers. He calls them masters, you know, which is kind of a weird term. I don't know if that's, you know, there might be a translation issue there. Uh, but a person may need a master. I think about a coach. So you might need a coach if your own willpower is not strong enough to stay, uh, to get on track with this and keep keep yourself there. Uh, so we know this. Maybe you don't have a strong, uh, you know, but let's say French. So you want to learn how, you want to learn French, but maybe you just don't have that discipline, that willpower, that desire to learn it badly enough. Uh, to learn it on your own, right? So in that case, it's nice to have someone, a coach, let's say, who can uh, encourage you and to kind of set up exercises for your games uh, for you to play, let's say. Uh, but the key here is that this is just a subjection of one of will over will. Uh, so that's not the same thing as stultification, which is when you think you're smarter than somebody else or this other person uh, needs you because their intelligence isn't quite as good as yours. Uh, so they need you to uh, perform that kind of role. So you never want somebody to think, well, I need a teacher because I'm not smart enough to learn this on my own. Uh, however, it's okay if you, if you need a teacher because you don't have enough willpower to do it. You need some encouragement. Okay, so this brings us uh, to the final uh, thing I want to talk about here, uh, this idea that just, you know, in the Ranciere's book, just as we have nowadays, the common person doesn't have enough time and uh, much less the money uh, to devote to learning things, right? So you're working full time. Uh, do you also have time to learn French <laughs> or learn whatever it is uh, you want to learn? Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money if you have to go to, to school for this. And wouldn't it be nice if there were some alternatives? And this is kind of Rod Sears' point, right? There is an alternative. You know, even uh, if you want to learn French, you can learn it from somebody who doesn't know French. Each ignorant person could become, for another ignorant person, the master who would reveal to him his intellectual power. And so that's kind of the idea I want to leave off with. And I'm already thinking here about MOOCs, the massively online uh, open courses. You can look at some of these. And that's this is kind of the, uh, some of these are completely student driven. So another way you could think about those sort of MOOCs, you know, by the way, these are free online classes. You get in there and there might be 10,000 other students taking this online class with you. So you might ask, you know, how is this even possible? How could anybody, uh, how could a teacher handle this many students, right? But when you get in there, it's kind of a strong peer component. So it's, it's, if you wanted to be crass about it, you might say, well, it's the ignorant leading the ignorant, uh, which some people would see, that's, see that as a bad thing. But I think Ron Sierra wants to say that's it's a good thing, right? It's even more genuine learning uh, than you would get otherwise. So I'll leave you there. It's about 20 minutes. Uh, if you do have questions, points you want to ponder in more uh, detail, post them on the forums, and hopefully we can uh, <laughs> get more into Ron Sierra as we proceed on to Chapter 2.